So I'm speaking with Professor John McGrath. He is a professor of molecular dermatology and head of the department at St. John's Institute of Dermatology. On behalf of the Skin Biology and Diseases Resource Base Center, I want to welcome you to Northwestern. Thank you, Professor Bella. I'm going to just ask you a few questions that we hope will uh, shed some light on science and your career for our viewers here at Northwestern and elsewhere. Sure, my pleasure. So, my first question, you've influenced the life of so many younger dermatologists and scientists and also so many patients. What individual has influenced your career the most? Well, thank you for saying that. It's uh, quite a challenge to think of an individual who's influenced my career. There have been so many people, but I think it's the sort of mentor, the teacher that listens to you, who gives you the chance to make your own mistakes, make your own successes, gives you time. And I'm thinking perhaps for my career over the last 30 years, uh, who stands out? Perhaps one mentor, Professor Robin Eady, who took me through my development as a, a registrar, a, res a resident in dermatology, and through my science teaching and training. But there was a man who'd faced all sorts of personal fortitude, having developed renal failure as a medical student, and then survived through getting dialysis in Canada and the US before it was available in Europe. And so that personal journey, leading to scientific discovery and showing how you can do original things on the background of other issues as well, was really quite fundamental. But a key thing for me in terms of Robin Eady was he didn't tell me what to do. He was a true mentor. He presented opportunities. And then it was up to me to make my mistakes or to make my successes, to make my own way in dermatology. And that's what I really appreciate, just being given a chance. I strongly believe in the academic winds of fate. If you train yourself up and present yourself with various opportunities and then let circumstance and opportunity come along and seize those opportunities, that's when your career can start to develop. And I'm, I feel very lucky to have been able to be blown by the winds of academic fate in some great directions. But thank you, Robin. Yes, and, and having known Robin for many years before he passed away, I can certainly understand how wonderful a mentor he was. Of course, then after you've started on with one mentor, you need other mentors to take over and help you. And, and the second key, most important person in my professional life has been uh, Professor Yoni Rito from Philadelphia. And sure. I learned so many things, both professional, personal, academic from him. And uh, he was another great influence on my career. And he continues to mentor so many to this day. Absolutely. So you've lived in many countries. You've lived right. in the US working with Yoni Rito, and certainly the UK, but also Australia. And as I learned a few years ago, Japan. So that's well. it. Yes. <laughs> um, so different cultures, different experiences. How do you think that's influenced your career? Yeah, it's really been a wonderful backbone to my life, having grown up since the age of nine in Japan and then as a teenager in Australia and having a wonderful opportunity to travel the world personally, professionally, and realize that we're just one planet. We have so many people with common goals, common attitudes. and when you surround yourself and network with similar-minded people who believe in goodness and hard work and doing the best for patients, then you really have the benefits of a fantastic life. And uh, I count my personal life and professional life all mingled together on an international level as being one of the most uh, valuable uh, personal stories for me. And we're so lucky now to be able to collaborate with people around the world so easily in a way we couldn't do many years ago. Exactly right, and even, I've only been in Chicago for a couple of days now, but already I'm still networking both here and around the world, and uh, still working on all those interesting cases and stories and science that, that have driven my story and, and everybody else for the last several years. Okay. Now there's a, a famous quote that says, I'd rather be lucky than good. Well, you've certainly worked very hard and have had tremendous numbers of successes. How has luck played into it? Yes, you're right. Luck is really very important. I, I like those sort of quotes. There's, there's one famous quote from uh, a famous uh, golfer, South African golfer called Gary Player, yeah. who was once winning lots of tournaments. And somebody said to him, gee, Mr. Player, you must consider yourself to be a very lucky golfer. He said, well, I guess you're right. He said, but the one thing I've discovered in life is the harder I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> and that's certainly how it is. You know that. In clinical Absolutely. dermatology, in academic dermatology, 
work hard, have that work ethic, surround yourself and involve yourself with good people, people who are better than you, learn new things. And that's where you're going to get personal satisfaction, get results, and most importantly, help patients uh, develop to a new level and get some new services and treatments for them. That's good. Now, we are entering our 11th year here of having a, a skin disease-based uh, research center here at Northwestern, and we have prided ourselves on really bringing people who have skills from other disciplines into doing skin research and being wonderful collaborators. We just talked about collaborators all around the world. Tell us a little bit about how you establish these collaborations and how important they are and how you've really been able to sustain them. You're quite right. We trained in dermatology. Dermatology, the study of skin, but I'm one person who wants to deologize dermatology. I don't believe in it just being a study of skin. It involves so many other disciplines that come together. But it doesn't happen naturally, does it? You have to no, somehow no. create uh, an infrastructure, a network, some sort of system where you can bring in biology and science from, and other disciplines that go way beyond the traditional medical subspecialties as well. How do you do it? There's no magic formula for that. I guess I'm lucky. I've been interested in genetic diseases and my lab and my career have been based around the patient. Patient first, patient most important. And so it's been a story of maybe identifying patients with genetic diseases. Maybe I've gone to some country, uh, presented some cases, looked at a poster or listened to another talk, chatted with individuals, and we built little stories out of those. Planting acorns, growing oak trees, find mutations, do a little bit of simple, straightforward genetic research. And on the back of that, start to involve other physicians, scientists, understand mechanisms of disease, start to create models, start to test new treatments. And so that requires all sorts of other associated personnel with mushrooms, and it just, it just gets bigger and bigger all the time. But it means you can answer and ask much better questions, more important questions that take us to that ultimate challenge of providing better care for patients. That's what I try and do. And you are indeed a physician scientist not always easy to navigate between the bedside and the bench, but you've done it so well. Any particular tips on how you're able to navigate those two worlds, obviously with the goal of bringing anything from the patient to the lab and then back again? Exactly. It is a challenge all the time, and it, you have to have fundamentally good clinical skills and to keep on top of those skills, to update them all the time, to be able to ask the right questions and to appreciate what's going on in front of you when you talk to a patient and you look at responses uh, to treatment and so on. And how do you do that? You just, it's just commitment to doing that. All of us who work as clinician scientists see it as a vocation. We have to make sacrifices elsewhere, but it's worth it because it's worth it when you can see the differences, how you take clinic to science and back to clinic again. There can be very few careers more rewarding than that. And I think it's that promise of delivering a better tomorrow for patients that really drives us on. I, I'm so happy to be, consider myself a clinician scientist. It's the hardest job in the world perhaps, but it's also the best job in the world and uh, for that I'm grateful it was a path I took. Yeah. And so meaningful to have these long-term relationships with these patients that through research we can help. It's like a special extended family and being able to work with them, to share their problems, their issues, their challenges, and then to try and take them to another level as we discover new things, as the global community discovers new things. I think one of the joys about building clinician scientist careers on a global level is we realize just how tough the challenge is for, say, genetic skin disease, and that many of us working together, hundreds of investigators, clinicians, clinician scientists, we can make incremental advances, but together we can be much more powerful. And the ultimate success is when we deliver something better for patients. However that happens, I don't really mind, as long as it happens. And uh, that's part of the journey we're all working on together. And you and I both had the pleasure of focusing on rare genetic skin disorders and working with children and young adults who, who have those rare genetic skin disorders and have such a tremendous impact on lives because of, of having those diseases. We spend a lot of time writing grants and finding funding to be able to go in the directions to help our patients. If you had all the resources in the world and you could just stop writing grants, you could use all the latest technology and 
you know, you were asked to focus on one thing with all of those resources, what would you do? Wow, that's a tough question. It is a tough question. It's a great question, of course, as well, because one of the uh, suggestions, is there a magic formula out there? Is there something that if you just throw money at it, you'll get the solution very quickly? It's what a lot of us ask. It's a natural question for patients as well. They think if there were just more resources, mm -hmm. then surely we'd get there tomorrow and we'd deliver those cures for individuals who are really suffering around the world. But it's not really like that. Science isn't necessarily linear or incremental. Sometimes you have nice moves, you have a little bit of collateral information, you make progress occasionally. Sometimes the field is stalled for a while and then something happens and it, it uh, provides a jolt to the system and we all move to the next level. It's important we reflect back, I think, and see where we were 30 years ago when you and I came into dermatology. For those genetic skin diseases, we had no idea about genes. We had no idea about what we could do for patients. We started to develop prenatal testing. We started to try and work on genetic counseling. We tried to work out what was going on. We went through an era of discovering genes and mutations, and it was helpful. We, got, we were better clinicians in the clinic looking after patients. That was fantastic. But it's only this last decade or so that we discovered what the story, what does it really mean to talk about gene therapy, protein therapy, cell therapy, and to be able to create teams, because you can't do it by yourself, create teams nationally and internationally that can develop clinical trials, purposeful clinical trials that can get you to the next level. It is a marathon, not a sprint story. I'd love to have a cure tomorrow. We all would. It's not really going to happen, but this journey with jumps forward and then a bit of stalling a little bit of progress and another jump forward that's great and as long as we can keep that momentum going then I think together we can make big progress and really help our patients and really understanding what the needs are and then leveraging the latest technology to try to move forward is, is what we do you're so right because a lot of us will focus on the technology but the clinician scientists in us always remembers to ask the patients what the patients want. And so one of the uh, conditions that you and I have worked on is epidemolysis bullosa, this fragile skin disorder. Mm -hmm. And we can sometimes get trapped in a silo of thinking about technology and gene editing and all of these gene therapies and approaches. And you ask the patients what they want. They want better wound healing. They want somebody to help their itch. They mm -hmm. want somebody to help their pain. So we have to remember that as clinician scientists, we have to focus our responses, both for the immediate concerns of the patient's symptomatology, as well as those other high-tech ideas that we might have that edge us towards a cure for these conditions. That's the challenge we've got to remember about here and now. Really, what we can do to affect quality of life, burden of disease, and make a difference today and tomorrow. That's the big challenge. And spending the time sitting and talking and really listening to our patients makes all the difference in the world. You're so right. There is no such thing as a quick consultation in genetic skin disease, nor should there be. We run tertiary referral clinics. When people come to our clinics, it's kind of the end of the line for now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So there is no time limit on consultation because if the patient is not happy with after they've left our office, then they don't know where to go. So it's about going on a journey. It's about giving time to individuals and time to understand and time to go on that journey of discovery and improvement together. Now you have certainly spent a lot of time, not just as a scientist and a fine doctor, but also trying to fundraise for epidemiolysis bullosa or EB. Uh, and I know as part of that fundraising, there's something called the EB tongue twister. How about sharing with us your favorite EB tongue twister? Gosh, now, thank you very much. Amy. I wasn't expecting that, but uh, uh, you're right, one of the charities for EB had a strap line which said, epidemiolysis bullosa, hard to say and hell to live with. Mm -hmm. And they managed to persuade a few celebrities to do some tongue twisters, many of which are available on YouTube. Uh, parental guidance uh, is a warning with those. Um, but uh, we tried a few in our lab. We have a few hits on YouTube, about 100 hits on YouTube. I've tried one in Taiwanese as well. I've tried one in Japanese, but I think the English one we, we, we tried is the one, let me have a go for you. Mm -hmm. This is unscripted, as you know, isn't it really? Let's try the Dick had a dog, the dog dug deep. How deep did Dick's dog dig? 
เด็กแคนาดาจะดักตายจีนคาร์ติกเด็กสตาร์ดักดักตายเด็กตายเสียการที่มันด้วยนะการนายเด็กสตอกดักตีเพื่อนเด็กสตาร์ดได้ that's a really quite a challenging one so if you can do that uh, I couldn't do it Tom Hiddleston couldn't do it and uh, hopefully uh, together we can get over the mistakes like that and try and make a difference but uh, that's fun that's trying to help uh, patients with raise awareness and raise funds for research into these uh, conditions so the disease isn't perfect The doctors aren't perfect, but together we can try and do something and make a difference. Hopefully, we'll make a difference. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much for spending some time with us here in Chicago. Uh, and thank you again for all the work that you do to help us advance in skin biology as well as to help so many who suffer from genetic skin disorders. It's been a great pleasure, and thank you very much for sharing this. Mm -hmm.